Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. If you'll stand in honor of God's word, I'll read out loud. You can follow in your Bible or on the screen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Into this grace in which we stand. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for grace. Thank you that grace is enough. Thank you that grace empowers us, encourages us. Thank you that grace envelops us with your presence. Thank you that grace energizes us to do the work of the kingdom. Lord, thank you for the gift of grace. Now, Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, may you speak into our hearts about what grace is really all about. What it really means, not just as a catchphrase, not just as a word that easily rolls off of our lips, but may we see in its depth what grace is about, what it entails, what it insinuates for our lives what claims it makes on us, what promises it guarantees us. Lord, may your word be spoken in power and conviction and boldness today, and may it be received with open hearts and open spirits, and may it change and transform. Lord, we claim your promise that your word will never go out and return void. And so we pray for the word of God to do its work today in this place, in Jesus' name. In this passage of scripture, there are four things that I think we need to see, but there are four things that are readily obvious. You have to dig a little bit to find some of these things. It doesn't mean they're not there. It just means sometimes what we see in God's word, we don't see it first reading or first glance. One of the things I love about God's word is that as you continue to read it over and over and over, it's kind of like an onion that, that peels a layer at a time. And every time you read it, you see it in a, a new depth, with a new understanding with fresh eyes. And that's one of the things you ought to be praying as you read God's word is that God will give you something fresh and new every time you read it. And this is one of those passages like that. As I studied the last few weeks for today, uh, I saw new things and, and new things about grace that I'd never seen before. And I want to share four of those things with you today what grace is all about. The first thing is this. I want you to see that this passage of Scripture, specifically verse 6, teaches us, or verse 2, teaches us that grace is all about accounting. It's all about accounting. We get this from this phrase that says, through whom also we have. The whom, of course, that Paul's talking about here is Jesus. It is Jesus through whom we have the ability to experience grace. But the reason that Jesus is the whom here, the reason that Jesus is the reason, the, the reason that Jesus is the one who gives us the ability to experience grace is because of what Jesus did. What Jesus did was he came into a world full of sinners who had a debt that they could not pay. We owed a debt because of sin that we could not fulfill. All of us were debtors. All of us have sinned. Because we have sinned, we have a sin burden. We have a sin debt. And Jesus came into a world full of people who had a sin obligation, a sin debt that they could not pay, that they could not fulfill. Jesus came into this world and gave himself and died on the cross 
and by dying on the cross, and by spilling his own precious, perfect blood, was able to acquire what was necessary in order to pay the account, to pay the sin debt for every human being who ever lived or ever would live on the face of the earth. That's amazing, isn't it? Amen. Jesus came and paid the price, paid the debt by his own debt. And so it's a matter of accounting because on one side of the ledger there is this debit, there is this debt that's owed. There is this obligation. It's a debt that you and I owe. It's a debt that you and I never could earn enough merit with God to ever satisfy, to ever take care of. On the other side, there is a credit on the other side of the ledger, and that credit comes in the form of the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And somehow, by the mercy and the love and the grace of God, God decided that he would be willing to take the credit that is on the side of the ledger that has to do with the sacrifice and the blood shed by Jesus, and in his own special way of accounting, move that credit onto our side of the ledger and satisfy the sin debt that you and I had. That's why grace is all about accounting. It's about God's form of accounting, where he took what wasn't ours, and was because of Jesus, and he has credited to our account. And so we sing a hymn like, Jesus paid it all. One of my very favorite hymns in all of this hymnal is Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Listen to these words. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Listen to this hymn. I'll sing of my redeemer. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and set me free. You see, grace is about the fact that God had decided that because he loved the world so much, that he would not only send and give his son, but then he would take the sacrifice that his son made and credit it to our account so that our debt could be paid, so that in our circumstances, in our situation, in, in the condition that we were in, a condition where we could never remedy that situation ourselves and never pay the debt ourselves, God stamped our account paid in full. Jesus came and paid our account and paid our debt in free. And he did that to ransom us. He did that to set us free. He said when he read Isaiah in the synagogue that day, I have come to set the captive free. Good news for the prisoner. Good news for those who are held captive. Good news for those who have no ability to remedy their situation on their own. Good news. I have come to set you free. I have come. I'm going to pay the debt. I'm going to credit it to your account. And I'm going to set you free. My way of accounting says what I did, I will count as though you did it. What I suffered, I will count as though you suffered it. What I bled, I will count it as though you bled. And you will be able to enjoy the benefits of my sacrifice and my death. And you will be able to come into experience of grace because of what my Father says I am to do in my accounting system. And that is to take everything that was on my side and move it to your side. That's good news. You wonder what good news is all about? You wonder what the gospel entails? That's it in a nutshell. That what we didn't deserve, what we couldn't earn, what we couldn't do for ourselves, Jesus did for us. But not only that, but then he moved all of that to our side of the ledger and said, paid in full. Paid in full. That's God's way of accounting. That's grace. The second thing that I think we need to see here in this passage of scripture is not only that grace is about accounting, Grace is about accessing. Grace is about gaining access. We get that from the phrase, through whom also we have 
obtain our introduction. That word introduction there is a really interesting Greek word. It's a word that means the act of moving toward or bringing to. In other words, through Christ, we have obtained this introduction where we have been moved toward and brought to God. We have been introduced to God. When you have a friend that you want to introduce to somebody who doesn't know them, what do you do? You move them toward them. You bring them to them and you say, hey, th this is my friend. I'd like you to meet them. This is this is somebody that I care about. This is somebody that's in my life. This is somebody that's, that's a part of, of my existence. And I want them to be brought into your life. And so I'm moving you toward them. I'm bringing you to them because I want to introduce you. That's exactly what this verse of Scripture means. Grace is where what Jesus did is credited to our account so that we can then be moved forward and brought into the presence of God. Folks, understand this, that without the sacrifice of Jesus, without the shed blood of Christ, we can't be brought to God. We can't be introduced to him. We can't be brought into his presence without what Jesus did for us on the cross. And therefore, Paul says, through whom we have received our introduction, we have obtained our introduction, our bringing to God, our moving forward to God. Why? Because of what Jesus did, we have been introduced to him. And understand this, that it is only through Jesus that we have access to God. Amen. Right. Now, we live in a world where it's not politically correct to say that. We live in a world that wants to believe that everybody's okay, that everybody's going to heaven, that, that there are lots of roads that lead there, and, and, and you can just believe anything you want as long as you're serious or as long as you are intent on believing that, as long as you're genuine in your faith, no matter what it is that you're going to get there. But the truth is that Paul says we have obtained this introduction, this accessibility to God one way, through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man, no man, there are no exceptions, no man comes to the Father except through me. We have been given access to the Father, but only through Jesus Christ. You can't be good enough to get into the presence of God. You can't get into the presence of God by going your own way, by going some other path, by believing in some other thing. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through you. Right, amen. Now people say, well, that's kind of mean-spirited, isn't it? God would only make one way. Well, not really. I, I think it's pretty awesome that God made a way because we didn't deserve a way. It wasn't our right to have a way. God could easily have let every one of us spend eternity in hell, and we would have been getting exactly what we deserved. But because he loved us so much, he did make a way. His name is Jesus. He did throw us a life preserver. His name is Jesus. And it is through Jesus that we have this introduction. We have been brought to God. We have been brought into his presence. We have been moved forward toward God, through whom also we have obtained our introduction. We have access to God. So grace comes through Jesus but grace gives us the ability to come into the very presence of God. Think about that. Now, this is the God of the universe. This is the God who created all this. This is the God who put the moon and the stars and the planets in space. This is the God who made the sun. This is the God who made the rivers and the mountains. This is the God who created this universe that we live in. This is that God. And because of Jesus Christ, you and I have the ability to come into that God's presence. I want you to think about what that means. Now, most of us would be honored, wouldn't we, if we got to meet somebody famous, if we got to shake hands with somebody who's a, a movie star, or somebody who's a celebrity, or somebody who's well-known. I think most of us would be 
honored to meet a, a political person, as long as it's not somebody that we despise. Get to shake their hand, say, hi, my name is, then to say, glad to meet you. I think most of us would be honored to meet the Queen of England, wouldn't we? Jane and I had the privilege a few years ago to stand in front of Buckingham Palace at the changing of the guard and watch all that, that stuff go on. It's it, it just kind of an amazing thing. And, 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 you know, you can't help but think when you're standing there, man, I wish the Queen had come out and waved and say hi. I think most of us would find that pretty neat. But we're not talking about a celebrity or a movie star. We're not talking about someone who's on television. A few years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Ira Joe Fisher. Everybody remember Ira Joe Fisher? He's the guy who could write backwards, the weatherman. I got to meet Ira Joe Fisher. I didn't wash my hand for a week. <laughs> but we're not talking about Ira Joe Fisher here. We're not talking about Bob Braun. We're not talking about a local celebrity. We're not talking about a movie star. We're not talking about a politician. We're not even talking about the Queen of England. We're talking about the God. Grace has given us access to him. Wow. Let that sink in for a minute. They say, well, what good's grace? Grace, okay, grace forgives me. Grace gives me salvation. Grace gives me a home in heaven. Yes, all that's true, but grace also gives us access to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to the God of you. Grace is all about accounting, what Jesus did for us. All about accessing, being able to go into the presence of God. Grace is all about acting. We get this from the phrase, by faith. I taught you before that faith is not a noun. Faith is a verb. It's an action word. You don't have faith, you do faith. We sing that old song, have faith in God, if it was Theologically correct, it would say, do faith in God. Because faith isn't something that we possess. Faith is something that we do. And so grace is about action. Because of what Jesus did, we have access into the presence of God, which will activate our faith and cause us to move, cause us to do, cause us to act. So you say, well, I received grace. This is one of the problems in the church at Rome. They say, well, we've gotten grace. We've been forgiven. And where there's sin, there's more grace than there is sin. And so shouldn't we just sin all the more? And, and Paul says, God forbid. And the reason the answer was God forbid is because when we have experienced grace, we are then activated to do faith. This is what James meant when he said, faith without works is dead. If we have faith, we will have works, not for salvation, but we will become, as Paul said in Ephesians 2, the workmanship of the Lord. We will then begin doing the good works which he has preordained before the foundation of the earth was ever laid. We don't have faith. We don't just experience grace. Grace overtakes our life. Grace empowers our life to cause us to do, to be active, to participate. Folks, listen, one of the real dire problems in the church today is the fact that we have become, as a church, a spectator sport. We have come to watch the show on Sunday mornings. We come to see how good the music is. We come to see how good the preaching is. We come to watch the show. You've all heard a little uh, story about the boy and his father who was sitting in church one day. And uh, they went through all the motions and they participated in all the different parts of the church service. And after church, the little boy and his father went out to eat. So the father was just complaining. He said, man, the music was horrible today. And the preacher wasn't on target today. And the people weren't friendly today. I just didn't enjoy church at all. The little boy turned to his father and said, Dad, I thought it was a pretty good show for 50 cents. Some of you will get that this afternoon. <laughs> Let me 
me help you out. See, 50 cents is all his daddy dropped in the office. You see, I think that becomes our attitude sometimes. Let's go see the show. Let's go see what the music guys got for us today. Let's go see the choir sing today. Let's go hear the preacher preach today. Let's go see how good a show it is. But this was never intended to be a spectator sport. And, and in some ways, I'm a little sad, I'm a little sorry that we have organized church in that way, that, that, that we make it easy for it to be that way. I mean, we even have a stage I don't think that's what God intended. When you read about that first century church, what you find out is they didn't come and observe church. They were the church. They did church. They participated in church. They didn't spectate. They participated. And grace in our lives, because of what Jesus has done, because of the accounting system where he has credited us with everything he did and given us access into the presence of God, ought to be moved to do the will and purpose of God's kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is a sign of your kingdom coming. That's what he taught us in the Lord's Prayer. That's what we studied together. So his kingdom coming is shown by us doing on earth what he does in heaven, which means we have to not spectate. Let me help you with this. I think one of the reasons we've got this so wrong is because we have such a wrong idea about heaven. I talk to people about heaven, and, and I've been asked the question a few times, and I've asked the question, what do you think we'll do in heaven? I've even had a few people say to me, you know, I think heaven's going to be pretty boring. Because so if all we're going to do is sit around and sing all the time, I'm going to get real tired of that. Let me, just, let me just reassure you about something. Heaven is not going to be one big church service where you sit in pews and watch the people on the stage do stuff. That's not heaven. Heaven, I believe, with all our heart, is going to be an active place where we are constantly about doing the purpose and the will of the kingdom of God. Heaven is going to be a busy place, not a place where we just sit back in our lounge chair and watch television all day long. I know some of you are disappointed because you thought that's what heaven was going to be. You know, the, the good news is you're never going to get tired, and you're never going to need to sleep, and you're never going to need to rest. Because you're going to have a new body that doesn't get tired, that doesn't get diseased, that doesn't get sick. And you're going to be able to go and go and go and go. And you're going to be like that little bunny that it never runs out. And earth is supposed to be a picture of that. We do. We act. Grace is about action. It's about doing. So what does that mean to be practically? What it means to be practically is I have to be about the business of the Father. It's interesting to me that even at 12 years old, Jesus was so full of grace that the driving force in his life was to do the Father's business. When he disappeared and his parents found him in the temple, he was surprised that they did not understand that being driven by grace would cause him to be about his father's business. Did you not know, the King James said, did you not know that I'd be about my father's business? There ought not be a one of us that knows Jesus and that names his name that is not about the father's business. So grace is about accounting, taking what Jesus did and crediting it to our account, about accessing God, being introduced, being moved, forward, bringing to God. It's about acting, doing the purpose and plan and will of God. But lastly, this is what I really want to say to you today. Grace is about abiding. It's about abiding. Look what he says. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. It's about standing. 
It's about abiding. It's about living in grace. Those of us who are Baptists, those of us who are raised in this way, and those of us who are from this, this culture of grace, have sometimes distorted salvation and distorted grace to the point where we believe that grace is a one-time experience at the moment of salvation and that that is kind of all there is here on earth until someday we die and go to heaven. So many of us have this attitude is I've been saved, I've experienced grace, I'm just waiting now to go to heaven. I don't know how many people I've talked to over the years who whether they voice that or not, that seems to be their attitude. I had this experience a long time ago, 10 years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I experienced grace. I've been forgiven. I know where I am with God. If I die right now, I know I go straight to heaven. And, and they understand that, but they have no concept of the fact that Paul says, I'm not just supposed to have experienced grace somewhere back there. I'm supposed to be abiding in and standing in grace on the day to day moment by moment basis. Grace is an everyday experience for the believer, not a one-time experience. And Paul says, through Jesus and his way of accounting, we have access, we've been introduced to God the Father who causes us to do the work of the kingdom and enables us to do that because we stand absolutely affirmed in the grace of God on a daily basis. I stand today in grace. And because I stand in grace, I know that what Jesus did for me when he died on the cross is still going to affect my life today. I know that the power that comes through the presence of the Holy Spirit didn't just happen to me once in a one-time experience, that it gives me power and strength and encouragement to live today. I know that what Jesus did on the cross and that what Jesus accomplished by rising from the dead is still an ever-present power in my life every single day. Why? Because I stand in the grace of God. I stand perfect and righteous and holy and just and pure and clean in the presence of God because of grace. I stand righteous before God today because of grace. Paul said, you have been made past tense the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I stand in right condition before my Lord today because I stand in grace. Now let's go back to my favorite hymn. The hymn writer got it wrong. Kind of. It's okay to say that. This isn't inspired by the scripture, okay? This is just the hell. And there's some stuff in here that isn't right. Let me show you a place that I got a problem with. The last verse of Jesus paid it all. It says, And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Let me tell you what's a little bit wrong with that. Same thing that's a little bit wrong with the solid rock, another one of my very favorite hymns. It talks about when the trumpet shall sound, and I'm going to stand in his righteousness alone. I got some great news for you today. I stand in his righteousness alone today. I don't have to wait for heaven to stand in grace. I stand perfect and righteous before God today. Because I stand in grace. What does grace do for me? Grace forgives me. Yes, grace gives me access to the Father. Absolutely. Grace accounts to my account what Jesus did on the cross. But grace also gives me the ability to come boldly before the throne of God and say, God, I come before you today, not based on what I've done, not based on my goodness, not based on my merit, not based on what I've been able to accomplish, but I come and I stand in your presence today based on what Jesus did and was credited to my account. I stand before you today, Father, in the righteousness of God, 
that comes because I'm not standing in my own power, in my own strength, in my own deeds, in my own talents, in my own abilities. I come and stand before you today in grace, knowing that grace covers all my sin, that grace is greater than all my faults, that no matter what I've done, or no matter how I have failed, or no matter how many times I have fallen, I can still stand in grace because I don't stand in grace by my own power. I stand in grace because Jesus died on the cross and descended into the depths of hell and marched in and took the keys of death and hell and rode victorious over the grave. And because he did that, I stand before my God righteous today, standing in God's grace. That is good news. Folks, listen. How is it that people who have experienced such grace, how is it that we can walk around and not let that show on our face? How is it that we can walk around in this world and people not know. I told you before, uh, Jane, and by the fact that I'm with Jane, uh, we watch lots of murder shows. <laughs> and we've learned something by watching this. If you listen to the description of all these people who get killed, it's pretty similar. And one phrase that they will say about these people who get killed almost every single time is that when they walked into a room, they lit up the room. Their smile would light up the room. And I told Jane repeatedly, quit smiling. <laughs> because it appears to me that that is a sure way to get murdered. <laughs> but here's the truth I believe that a child of God who understands grace won't be able to walk into a room without lighting it up because man if you understand what Paul says in these two verses if you understand that grace has credited to your account what Jesus did, giving you access to God, and enabled you to do the works of God and stand in right standing before God. How can that not change everything about who you are? We were in China several years ago, and in China you had to be very careful, at least at that time you had to be very careful about what you shared and what you said. And our daughter had arranged for us to speak in a little group called English Corner, it's where all the Chinese students come to the middle of the campus. And they speak uh, to English, they listen to English speakers and then they have conversations and ask questions and it helps their English. And so uh, we were standing in the middle of the Aoshan University one afternoon for English Corner and all these Chinese students all around us asking these questions about America and about the English language and all this sort of thing. And one of the students turned to my wife and said, why is it that you smile all the time? Now when they ask you a question, you can answer. Why is it that you smile all the time? Jane looked at that Chinese student and said, because I have Jesus in my life. That's what's standing 